Well, good evening, everybody. And my name is Kevin McHenry, and I'm the headmaster of St. Andrews College. There are very many people here from the community, and uh, probably many of you have never been on campus at St. Andrews, so I want to wish you a very, very warm welcome to St. Andrews College. Uh, very quickly, uh, we have been located in Aurora, probably have been located in Aurora since 1926. Uh, the school actually started in Toronto in 1899, so we're 113 years old now. We are all boys, of course. Uh, all boys, grade uh, five. We start with grade five next year, grade five to 12. 590 students from 25 countries around the world, and we have about 260 boarders and 330 day students. That's, in a nutshell, who we are and uh, where we came from. That, that was, again, in Toronto. I'm only the eighth headmaster in the 113-year history of the school, and my wife Karen and I and our three children live on campus with about 40% of our faculty and staff and it's a residential community, so it's a great place to, to raise a family. So just wanted to wish a very, very warm welcome to everyone here. Um, I don't want to take any more time because we as a school are thrilled to have uh, a Canadian legend with us who made the, the trip down uh, yesterday afternoon and will be leaving to go back to Quebec tomorrow morning. Uh, so it's our absolute pleasure. He's been with, uh, we worked him really hard today uh, from uh, last night's dinner and uh, he began at 8 o'clock this morning and has been going non-stop all day. So he's doing great and I'm sure he's going to sleep well tonight. I do want to turn the microphone over to one of our teachers. Uh, she's working in our library and, and will be our point person for our grade 5 program next year. Uh, her name is Claudia Rose Donahoe and over to you Claudia. With great pride tonight, the St. Andrews College welcomes Mr. Carrier to our school. Mr. Carrier began his career as a post-secondary educator and later moved on to become principal. His other accomplishments are too many to name in full, but I will list the highlights. In 1991, Mr. Carrier was made an Officer of the Order of Canada, the second highest Canadian honour of merit. From there, he served as the Director of the Canada Council for the Arts and he later went on to become the National Librarian of Canada. Growing up, Rock Carrier always knew he wanted to become a writer. In 1968, Mr. Carrier published his first novel, the very popular La Guerre, Yes Sir. Since then, he has written many other novels, short stories, plays, film and television scripts, essays, travel books, and poems. Millions of, ch and millions of children and adults all over the world have enjoyed the hockey sweater for more than 30 years now. To many, there is no other work of literature as iconic in its portrayal of Canada's favorite pastime, the Canadian winter, childhood nostalgia, and the relations between French and English-speaking Canadians than this beloved, timeless classic. In fact, Mr. Carrier is such a Canadian icon that when you go home tonight, I encourage you to open your wallet, pull out your old familiar $5 bill, look at the back of that bill, and if you look really closely in the top left-hand corner, you will read the following quote from the hockey sweater. The winters of my childhood were long, long seasons. We lived in three places, the school, the church, and the skating rink, but our real life was on the skating rink. Please join me in welcoming a wonderful, gracious man and a Canadian legend, Mr. Rock. We saw many good things that are just incredible, incredible, all kinds of nice male, all kind of thing, amazing. A lady was telling me that her dad passed away at the hospital and they called the lady to tell her to come to the hospital and to pick up the stuff that his dad, her dad was having with him and she was telling me that among the little things that he had, he had a copy of the hockey sweater story. Uh, another one, uh, I would not <laughs> make the old list, but another one. Uh, I was at a meeting, kind of serious meeting, and at the end of the meeting, uh, a gentleman told me, oh, I'm sorry, I don't want to waste your time, but I must tell you something. My mom is at the hospital, and she's very old, and she's a little bit, I would say, lost. He didn't say that word, but I would say, lost. 
And what he did, he took the hockey sweater story and he cut out the face of his brothers in a, a photograph, album of photographs, and he glued the face of his brother on the face of the character. So every day the mother was taking the little book and she was turning the pages. Amazing! All kinds of things like that, just uh, in incredible. In one of my... <laughs> I was in London, Ontario, reading in the gymnasium, and I started to read, and suddenly the old attendants, all the kids, were reading the story, but speaking with my accent. <laughs> That was incredible! <laughs> so it was uh, around Christmas time and there was a lunch, some guests were invited and were there, and I told them that story, it was a, just a new story. And one of the <laughs> young men said, I don't believe you, because in our school we will never do that. And he started to tell the story by heart with my accent. <laughs> Amazing. Just <laughs> so the class reopened in September, in, uh, in uh, January, and I was principal of a school, and suddenly there was a big problem in my school, a big, huge problem. Now, I'm a bit of a dreamer, I said, I have to, to be good to, to talk to the premier of Quebec. But of course, it's not possible. But I always believe that things are possible. So I told my secretary, okay, just let's try, let's phone, please phone to the, to the assistant of the Premier of Quebec and tell him that I need to see him. Of course she phoned and of course she got the answer that he's extremely busy and he has a lot of meetings and it's impossible. But perhaps later he would get in touch with me and that's it. 30 minutes later, about that, there was a phone call. Oh, the, prim the Premier would like to see you tomorrow morning. Whoa! I just be didn't believe that. So I was there in the morning on the Vanille Bank Street. I went to the security and all that. And I was introduced in a kind of small dining room or breakfast room. And the premier was sitting at the end of the table, at the head of the table, and I walked, and I was a bit like nervous, you know, and I'll, I'll go. And he was sitting there with a smirk, and he started to say, the winters of my childhood were. <laughs> uh, we were, I was telling that story to the, to the, uh, to the students this morning. Uh, we, we were, perhaps three years ago, in the United Arab Emirates and we presented the film that they made out of the story. And at the end of the story, in the church, you have the little boy who is praying for having the moths, but Maurice Richard appears on the cloud and puts his arm on the little boy's shoulder. That's a very nice little scene you know, in, the, in the film. And we were showing the film to a school of religious uh, children. So they were wearing the white hat and the white gown. And there was a question. Sir, at the end, what the person that appears in the sky, it was Maurice Richard, is he your Jesus? <laughs> Kinds of <laughs> interpretation. So I, I wrote that story a, a long time ago, and it's always a pleasure to reconnect and to read it to a new audience. Uh, hockey, I guess, is something very, uh, uh, very important in Canada. <laughs> I, dis I discovered that if you speak hockey, you speak to everybody. Uh, hockey is a 
kind of metaphor we can bring. Let's say, if something is difficult to explain, you just have to say, it's like hockey. <laughs> Suddenly, everybody starts understanding before you speak. <laughs> and then, yes, they, they, they understand. And I remember, in one of my responsibilities, I needed money from government. And we didn't have budget to make any publicity. And you have to compete with all kinds of agency. You have to compete for the people who are doing the lobbying and all that. And I didn't have any means. But I was at the National Library. And I was told that we had in our collection all kinds of old photographs. And I think, photographs? Well, and hockey, if you talk hockey, you talk to everybody. I said, do you have any hockey photographs? So they started to do a research, and suddenly I learned that they had a photograph of uh, ex Prime Minister Pearson play hockey in London when he was a student. There was a photograph of a group of uh, women, I think it was in Aurelia, Ontario, a feminine hockey team if I'm not mistaken, there was all kinds of photographs like that. So I said, oh, I have an idea, we'll do hockey cards. I found one of my friends who is in the printing business, I said, listen, we don't have a penny, but we want to do some publicity, we want to do some hockey cards. Would you print for French, for nothing, would you print some cards? So we made the numbers of 100, a hockey card, you know, a series of something like 10. And I was going to social event where there were some politicians and I was showing the hockey card. You see, this is what we produce at the National Library, hockey card. Oh, can I have some? Oh, uh, we don't have many. I will see that they, those are my, my uh, personal ones, but I will see at my office and I, I will call you uh, if, if we have. And with those cards only, everybody who had the responsibility in Ottawa, they wanted to have hockey cards. And it was always difficult to get them, and the only person finally who could deliver them was me. Yeah. And so I had access to everybody. <laughs> Thanks to Hockey. At the same time, we were producing reports and analysis, very serious. You know, I had accountants, I had a lawyer, they were working for me. Real serious report. We got the money thanks to the hockey cards. <laughs> so that's that's um, Would you have any any question? It would be nice to turn this into a dialogue now. I would be ready to try to answer. Yes. Is the now? Is it much larger? The town. And the question is, how big? What is the population of Saint Justine now? Oh, the. the <laughs> In St. Justin, it was a very small town. When I was there, I think the population was something like 1,800 and some souls. And there was a bit of competition with the next village, because the next village was a little bit over 2,000. And the priest in the next village was making more money than our priest. So very often, the kids we did not understand what it meant, but very often, on Sunday, in the sermon, the priest will tell the man that they had to do their, was in French, their devoir d'état, their, their duty. They had to do their duty. And I understood later what it meant. <laughs> So today, I think the, the population is about 2,000. But it's a nice little place on the hill. It was a great place to, to, to grow up. It was far away. It's something like south, uh, uh, east of Quebec City, and close to the border of the state of Maine. 
So my learned work, you know, as a kid, it was war time. So I knew that there was the war in Europe. Where was Europe? I have no clue. But I was walking out. I was really on this side of the hill, on the top of the hill here, there was the church, and on the other side there was the school and the skating rink. So I was walking to the church, and in front of the church there was nothing, so I could see very, very far away. So the wall, what is the wall? Let's say we heard the parents talk about that. So the wall is there, or perhaps there, or perhaps <coughs> there. Nobody. Oh, perhaps I forgot, but nobody was telling me it's there. It was somewhere there. Now, from my room, my bedroom, where there was a window, there was a, a field, and there was the forest after that, and there was like nothing. But it was the US, the American border. So as a kid, in my village, so there is the world, there is the war, and there is the American border. And my dad made my life very simple because one night there were like lights very far away, like in the forest. And my dad said, this is New York lights. <laughs> and I was connected to New York because we had cousins and cousins of cousins living in New York. And from time to time they were coming from New York to visit in summertime and they had bigger cars that we had, and they had golden teeth, so they were going very, very well. So, again, that was my world. I, I was curious, I was sailing close to Europe, but there was war there, and very close to the US because I could see New York, the lights of New York City, and there was Quebec that way. So that was my world. I was very curious about all that, and I was reading, uh, my dad brought me one, let's say my dad was going from village to village, and he was selling stuff to the farmers, and dealing and wheeling, and probably giving some stuff, buying a cow, selling the cow next door, and changing, so that's how he was making his, uh, 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 he was making his living. And one day, he came back home <coughs> with a series of books, it was an encyclopedia, youth encyclopedia. That was the first real book that uh, I saw. And I went from the beginning to the end, I read every day all the articles. So <laughs> that's where I was uh, growing. It was a nice place, you know, there was nothing, and when there is nothing, you invent something. And uh, yeah, we were inventing a life, our life every day. We would not count on anybody. We would never trust the government, nothing. And many people would not trust the bank. They were wise in those days. <laughs> uh, the business was made on the uh, shaking hand. I want to borrow money. Yes, I will be able to get the money easily, shake hand, and I would get the money easily because my dad was paying his debt, my grandfather paid his debt. But if my grandfather had not paid his debt, I would not have access to money. And one day, uh, I remember I was small, perhaps five years old, and my grandmother and my grandfather was talking about Mr. So-and-so, <coughs> who was owing money to them. And that's what, that was a real serious thing. So at lunchtime, learn me, five, perhaps six years old, I go, I knock at the door of this gentleman. They have a big family, seven kids, around the table, they are eating. I get in, I pull out the screen door, get in, and I oh! Ah, Monsieur Shabbat, you have to pay your debt to my grandfather. <laughs> and I went out. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a very simple, world, very naive, great, 
let's say we knew everybody. Uh, there is a journalist in Montreal that uh, wanted to do something. Uh, there was a player by the name of Alex Tanguy, was playing at the time for Canadian. Now he's playing for Calgary. Alex Tanguy, and he comes from Saint Justin, and the journalist had the idea of having a meeting between Alex Tanguy, who became a professional player, and Le Mi, who was a rotten hockey player, but I love the hockey sweater. So we met. We never met before. And we had <laughs> this funny dialogue that let's, I, didn't, I never met him before. I didn't know his father, but I knew his grandfather who was a hockey player, and I knew his great-grandfather who was a truck driver with a great sense of humor. And I told him one other story that this morning, Mr. Targay was driving his truck going down the hill in Saint Germain and probably started to doze off or he was distracted. He lost the direction. He went to the side and he crashed into the house, the wall of the house. So the lady of the house gets out of bed and rushed out on the balcony. And the trucker, Mr. Targay, was wearing a hat. Good morning, madame. I hope you were not expecting me that early this morning. That was the world I was growing up. <laughs> In a great place. So thank you for the question. Yes, I have one question for you. Did you ever have a chance to present this book that was the job? Yes. I met uh, the first time I met Monsieur Richard uh, per, uh, personally, uh, it was at the CBC in Montreal, now it's exactly 30 years ago, when they, uh, they published uh, the, the film, the little animation film. So they projected for the uh, audience the film and they invited Monsieur Richard and I. Uh, it, it was uh, something kind of special. Uh, now, I was a young writer and uh, quite proud of myself. You know, my book, first book, was doing very well. I was not in hockey anymore. You know, I was in my head, big head. And uh, Okay, so I will meet Monsieur Richard. I just don't believe that I'm meeting with uh, Rocket Richard. I don't believe it. Well, but Rocket, it's a hockey player. He should not be that excited. It's just, just hockey. So I had that type of weird, stupid feeling. Perhaps I was very nervous. I was trying to rationalize all that. Anyway, we were in the makeup room and sitting together. And the conversation was, is it, was that the man who was talking easily? And because of my pretentious and my idiot attitude, I was curious, but I didn't want to be seen as being curious about a hockey player. So there was a bit of stupid dialogue. Oh, it's cold, the sneakers, it's very cold. Yes, it's cold. <laughs> <laughs> and Rocket didn't like to have powder put on his face. He didn't like that. That I remember. And we went into the studio and they showed the film. And at the end, after the film, they asked Monsieur Richard, uh, what do you think of the film? He didn't do a big analysis of the film. He just said, oh, could I have some copies for my children and grandchildren? So that, that was his comment. And now I appreciate, but at the time, of course, he's just a hockey player. You know, he, he could have done more for that. But, but I had a better encounter later. It was here in Toronto. Uh, we came to present the film to the players of the Maple Leaf. It was in the old Maple Leaf Garden. So the players had to practice, and after the practice, they attended the show, <laughs> they saw the film, and then there was a lunch. 
And the young players, that's amazing, the long players, of course, they didn't like too much the uniform, but they all enjoyed the film. And all of them had great respect for Maurice Richard. The owner of the club was Mr. Ballard at the time. And Mr. Ballard was not the most subtle of men. <laughs> but he was quite a character, I was really impressed. So at some time in Mr. Richard's uh, career, he had some problems in Montreal. Suddenly he was not scoring goals as he used to. The management was not terribly satisfied. He was getting a little bit older. <coughs> he had real personal problem with the manager. And there was an offer that came from Toronto. Mr. Richard, will you join Toronto? There was serious offer. So serious that suddenly there was a photograph of Rocket Richard wearing the Toronto uniform published in the front page. Now, I have a blank. What is the other paper than the, the, the Globe and Mail? Telegram. Telegram. The Telegram. So, in the, there was a front page, Rocket Richard wearing the maple leaf sweater. And finally, it did not happen. Madame Richard was, I believe, a champion that was bigger than Maurice. <laughs> and Madame Richard said, Maurice, si tu t'en vas à Toronto, les gens ici, people here, will kill us. <laughs> Monsieur Richard didn't take the offer from Toronto. So they were talking about that. But Mr. Ballard said, Rocket, if it had been under my time, in my time, I would have taken you and you would have joined my club. That was about how it was talking to, to Maurice Richard. So that was very interesting to me to see those two guys who had a lot of history, finally, that they, they were sharing. That was a great, great moment. And you had some young players, and I forgot the name, and we'll have to go back to the internet to remember, remember the name, but they were listening, like really like young kids in school, they were listening what was taking place, it was great. Boris Richard had not played when we were in Toronto, like this, Maurice Richard had, had played his last game perhaps 20 years before that. And he, was, he became very impressive, quite a big valet, uh, smoking a big cigar. <coughs> and in those days, the fashion was to wear in the springtime gabardine, the kind of coat that you were gabardine, so the kind of fabric. So that's what. Uh, that's how Mr. Richard was dressed, and we were getting out of the Maple Leaf Garden. Mr. Richard walking, and people were walking back. Yeah, again, he had not played the game for the last 20 years. People were walking back, but stopping. You're the rocket! They, that's how they were reacting. You're the rocket. Oh, would you give me a signature? I don't have paper. Oh, would you write? something on my package of cigarette and Rocket gave number of autographs on our way to the hotel. It was a beautiful day. And I felt good about Toronto. Because after that, after he signed, people were looking at me. They didn't know me. <laughs> but because they were very polite, would you give me your signature? <laughs> and I gave my signature. And I went back to Montreal and I told them that how much in Toronto people have respect for writers. <laughs> <laughs> we went to finish with that story. We, we went back to the hotel and Monsieur Richard told me, uh, Rock, I'd like to show you something. So I went to his room and he had received gift 
There was some publicity about this coming to Toronto. We were on the Peter Zarsky show, there was some interview, so people knew that he was in Toronto at that time, and he showed me what he received. I don't remember a number of days, but I remember jam. So there was a lady who did some strawberry jam for the rocket, and the rocket went back with the jam. There was also uh, somebody needed a, a sweater, Canadian sweater for Rocket Richard. Somebody made a, a painter, uh, Rocket Richard, and his skates playing. I remember those kids. There were a number, a number of them. So thank you for your question. <laughs> yes, Mr. You, you talk very loud because I'm an old man at all. You have two questions. Okay, that's good. Let's start with the first one. Um, the first one is, who is your favorite current hockey player? <laughs> My favorite? Uh, I, I have to be honest. This season, I lost track. I, I worked very hard, and I traveled quite a bit. I was out of the country quite a bit. And I must say that when I came back to Montreal, I saw some news in the newspaper about the team, and uh, so I don't know what's happening really. Okay, then what's your favorite current team? <laughs> 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 what can I say? All my life, all my life, when I was even very busy, I actually could not watch the hockey game. But in the morning, the first thing I look in the paper is what happened in hockey. And if my favorite team win, I know that it would be a good day. <laughs> <laughs> now, for the last two months, I've been checking. <laughs> but next year, I'm telling you, <laughs> we will be back. So that was a very good question. From your okay. And my second question. Third um, question. Oh, you don't remember. Oh, yeah, you can go. Hey, I will go back to you. Okay? Yeah, monsieur. What inspired you to That's That's a good question. That's a very deep one. The answer is, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> no. How old are you? I'm uh, 12. 12. So when I was 12 years old, I was reading books, and I was reading comic strips. And I like, I like story. I like story a lot. And uh, uh, so I was reading books. But I never talked about somebody writing the books. I didn't have that. And a little bit later, that's around 13 years old, I discovered that there was somebody who would sit down and write or type and invent a book. And I don't know why. I want to do that. That's what I want to do. And I still want to do that. And when I go back to Montreal tomorrow afternoon, I go back to my desk and I will start writing the story. Because I just like that. And talking about reading. Reading is a great adventure. You travel when you read, and when you write, you travel, you experiment. Some months ago, I, had, I received a very nice email, and I was amazed. The email was coming from the space. It was coming from a Canadian astronaut. And Mr. Carrier, uh, I am <laughs> in the space station, and perhaps you will be interested by the photograph that I'm sending to you. So I went to see the photograph that the astronaut was sending to me. And the astronaut was sending to me a photograph of himself in the space station, on his little bed in the space station, reading the hockey sweater. <laughs> the 
because they have the permission to write, uh, to, to bring with them some personal object. And was absolutely, I don't know the word, I know the word flabbergasted, so I would say I was flabbergasted by that uh, photograph. And it touched me very, very deeply. And I will tell you why it touched me so deeply. And I told that to the astronaut. So when I was a kid, I was reading, there were not many books around me, but there was the newspaper. And I was looking at, before I knew how to read, looking at the comic strips. And then when I knew how to read, I was reading the comic strip. And I was fascinated with a character by the name of Brick Bradford. And Brick Bradford was traveling the space, traveling the century in a rocket. I wanted to do like Brick Bradford. So I was nine years old perhaps. I wanted to go on my rocket. I didn't have a rocket. No problem, I will build a rocket. And my dad put, uh, put some order in his garage and he built a little wall to keep the stuff behind the wall. It was in plans. I wanted to build my rocket. I needed some planks. So I took my hammer and I pulled some planks from my, the wall that my dad <laughs> built. And I built my rocket. And then I sat down on my rocket and I flew. So perhaps that's why I like to ride, you know. It's always an experience. So I told that to Robert Trisk, and he liked the story too, of course. Yes, madame? Are you still writing books for children, or uh, I'm not writing for children now, but I have a project <coughs> that will be, it's more than a project. I was asked if I would be interested in uh, uh, writing books for boys who hate books. <laughs> I was interested by that. So I said, I don't know if I, I'm interested in that, but I don't know if I can do it. So they wanted to give me a contract and pay an advance and all that. I said, no, let's be, let's be cautious here. Yeah, I don't know if I can do it. I will try to do one and then we evaluate the situation. So I started to work and I worked and I worked and I produced the first one. And I gave that to the publisher. Publisher read and they said, yeah, okay, so we can go for the series, that's good. I said, oh, I could write one, but I'm not sure that I can write two. <laughs> Let's try a second one if I can do it. And now I have written six. And the two first one will be published next September for boys who hate books. <laughs> okay. Pro what do we do? Probably you are tired to listen to me. <laughs> as much as they want. Okay, so you, 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 you tell me when you have enough. <laughs> let's, let's be easy. Yes, monsieur? Why didn't your mom understand writing in English? English. Oh, uh, that's a good question. It's because my, my mom was French speaking, so she could understand only French. So she could not read English. She could not say a word. 
in English because her parents were French and she was living in a place where everybody was French. And when I was growing up, where I was living, everybody in my little village was speaking French. Uh, English, we didn't hear any English except on the radio. But we didn't know, I didn't know it was English. I was turning the knob, you know, to go from station, it was a long radio station, to go from radio station to radio station, I was turning the knob, and there was some noise. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know it's later that I, I understood it was English. But I, when I was a young kid, I believed, believed it was noise. Oh, it's noisy today. <laughs> oh, but my mom was out oh, probably the temperature. Yes, monsieur. Um, just a question. When, when did you realize that you were a good writer? When, uh, when, what was it that you wrote, maybe? Or, I don't know. You can elaborate on that. You know, there is something that I like in the fact of writing. It is that you're always a beginner. And whatever you did, you're a beginner. And it's not because you found something interesting three days ago that today you would be able to do it. And I just like that, to be a beginner. Because when you're a beginner, there is enthusiastic, there is a fresh view. And so, I, I don't know if I'm a good writer. And even if I have written great books, uh, I will not think about that. What I would think is what I will do tomorrow afternoon and will it be good stuff or bad stuff. So there is, it's a place that there is never a security of, it's very, it's very soft, you know, you, you don't know. And I like this approach, and even in my professional life, you know, I like to be a beginner. I like to be appointed to a job. That, I don't know anything about. So you are in, all right, you come, what's going on here, what are you doing? That's great, that's a good feeling. You start something, you learn how it works, you see how it can work better, and that's really amazing. And when you have no experience of that place, you see all kinds of things. I remember an organization, I came in, get out of the elevator, I notice the clock. The clock has no hands. That's curious. The place I was before, they had obsession with the clock. You know, there was staff <coughs> taking care of the clock to have the right time. And this place, the clock has no hand. That's weird. I had an assistant, did you? How come the clock has no hand? Which clock? The clock on top of the elevator door. Oh, I never saw that. There is a clock there. I speak to somebody. That's, did you see the time? What time it is? There is no hand. Oh, there is no hand. Okay, so I spend one day, two days, and then I go to the ground to see the clients, what they think about us. We had a meeting, and I got this comment. Oh, sir, your organization is the best one. The best one. They gave us the best possible answer, so well documented. But when we received the answer to our request, it took so long that we forgot we asked a question. Oh, 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 connection with the clock with no hand. The week after, there is a letter from the boss about the mail. <laughs> from now to then, <laughs> from now on, all the mail will have to be answered in a period of eight days. See, <laughs> I like to be a beginner like that. So you learn, you build. And so when you know, it's time to go. <laughs> yes, mademoiselle. Excuse me, um, just for the, we have been working with your 
preparing very hard today. He's been working since 8 o'clock. So we're just going to take one more question. Thank you. Story. Were you the little boy in the story? I'm sorry? Were you the little boy in the story? Was it a true story? <laughs> <laughs> yes. It, it, for me, it was a real true story. It was really, really me. And uh, my, let's say, I grew up and my mom was following me every Sunday at noon time, 10, uh, 11 minutes after noon. So I didn't have to wait for the rain, I just had <laughs> to take the phone and my mom was there at 11 minutes after noon. And one morning, it was something like 8 o'clock, the phone rang, it was my mom. Rock. You're a big liar. You're a gros menteur. You're a big liar. What for? She had seen the book and read the story. So it was all lies. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> and <laughs> what will people think of me now? <laughs> but it was a real, real story. Now, the, uh, she, she took a photograph of me, and you can find the photograph on the internet uh, easily. She took a photograph of those Kodak box you know, that they had in those days. And I'm there, nine years old, wearing my maple leaf sweater, and I think I'm smiling because many people said to me, look, if you didn't like the Toronto Maple Leaf sweater. How come you're smiling at the photograph? 